Chapter 4, Chapter 3, The Violent City Chapter 3, The Violent City Easy, girls, Ryu murmured, holding his hands before him. I'm not going to hurt you. Easy, easy. Nice biru biru. Unfortunately, the monsters menacing him a tough, purple-skinned hybrid of Sao and Kao were more concerned with their ability to hurt him. Squealing, they both charged simultaneously, and Ryu cursed, diving awkwardly over their wicked horns and landing on the back of one. Bucking wildly, it attempted to throw him off, but he was able to hold on long enough to cut its throat. Enraged, its companion attacked again, and he shoved the carcass into it. Before it could recover, he stepped around and sent it off with a stab to the eye. Man, oh man, what a wake up! Wincing, Ryu cleaned his sword and sheathed it again after carefully looking around for any more monsters. The eastern seacoast stretched north for several more miles before reaching a small forest, he'd have to head back to the west and rejoin the path at that point. The good news was, when he did, he'd be able to reach his destination within the day, so he wouldn't need to stick to the coast. Without Bo's hunting skills, he had been forced to rely on his own talent with the fishing rod for all of his meals. At the moment, no more threats were visible, but he knew that was hardly a guarantee for long. Sighing, he glanced back at the dead Biru Buru. A couple more days of nothing but fish, and I'll probably be finding out if these things are edible. Prodding one with his foot, he considered it, then shook his head and turned to the ocean. To the northeast of Oria was the land of Tantar, hereditary homeland of the reclusive forest clan. Said clan had shunned contact with the outside world for many centuries now, reportedly due to conflicts with the Church of St. Eva, and the human population of the country had expanded in their absence. Their capital city of Corsair was relatively new, but it was a popular destination for travelers due to the massive Colosseum at the city's heart. It had taken him half a week since he had crossed the border between the two lands, at the bridge across the river Bleak, to get that far. As he sat on the shore, fishing line dangling into the water, something caught his eye further out, what appeared to be a man-sized fish, wearing clothes. It was a Menero fisherman, apparently swimming north towards Corsair. On a whim, Ryu decided to try something he had heard about in a bar a few months ago. Yesterday, he had been attacked by a murderous devil kid, one of the violent imps that infested Tentar, despite the awkward name, they were neither hellish in origin nor sentient children. More importantly, he had found a piece of fool's gold in its claw after killing it. Reeling his line back in, Ryu took off the bait and tied the end of the line around the rock instead before casting it back out. As he had been told, the Menero clan's inherent eye for gold was so phenomenal that the passing fishermen saw the glint immediately, barreling down on it like a shark. Ryu waited, amused, until it grabbed the glittering bait, and curses began to bubble to the surface. A few minutes later, it burst from the water's surface, fool's gold in hand. All right, wise guy, real funny, the Menero told him sourly. As far as Ryu could tell, he was an old man, the Menero clan had no hair to turn gray, and scales instead of skin, which didn't wrinkle with age. Said scales had silver patches mixed with their normal orange hue, though, and the white fins on the top and sides of his head were unusually long. You're lucky I've got a good sense of humor. Some folks would pound you into canned lizard for that kind of stunt. What if I wanted to see if you had anything interesting to sell? Ryu countered, ignoring the bizarre threat. Hey, why didn't you say so? Blasting out of the water in a surprising display of agility, the mineral landed on his feet next to Ryu, unstrapping the huge pack he wore on his back, so large it had to be reinforced with wooden poles. The name's Gobit, nice to meet you. Now then, I have some very nice sets of steel armor, perfect for the aspiring gladiator. Or, if you're more of an offensive type, I'm also stocking some silver daggers, enchanted with fire magic. I'll let both of those go for only 1,400 zenny each. A bargain price, let me tell you. Um. Old man. Ryu held up a hand. Do I look like I can afford anything that's 1,400 zenny? Look at me. Good point. Goba scratched his chin. Yeesh, kid. Is that a salad bowl you're wearing on your head? Please say no. It used to be, Ryu admitted. It was cheap, and it keeps flying rocks from braining me. You go with what you can in my position. I'm all for bargain hunting, kid, but you gotta draw the line somewhere, Goba told him, grimacing. You'll never get a girlfriend looking like that. Hell, you'll probably get laughed out of all the bars in Corsair. Tell you what, I'll help you out with that instead. Reaching into his pack, he produced an actual helmet, admittedly one without any facial guard, flared around the edges. Standard issue for the Windian guard, and they're a cut above your normal watchman. I got these babies at a steal on account of surplus, so I can let them go cheaper than I usually would, too. 
Eight hundred zenny, and believe me, you're never gonna find a better offer on these babies. Hmm. Ryu examined the helmet. It was authentically well made, he could tell, and Bao had given him almost all of their combined savings for use on his quest. It was tempting. I'll give you 750. 795, go be countered. 760. 790. Throw in some information about what the air's like up in Corsair right now, and you've got yourself a deal, Ryu said. He had had dealings with Menoros before it was hard not to, since their merchants more or less controlled the global economy by now and he knew that haggling too extensively would just make things worse. I thought you were heading up there. Goba smiled. All right, deal. What did you want to know? How to find a tavern called the Rat's Head, Ryu said as he pulled out his wallet. The story on this fighting girl I've heard about at the Colosseum. And anything else I should be keeping my eye out for. Elder Allen's letter had told him that the local ranger's guild office was located behind the tavern, but hadn't specified where said tavern was. The new girl, hey. Goba chuckled. I know what you're thinking, kid, but trust me, don't. Her first night in, some guy tried putting the moves on her. She put him and six of his buddies in the doctors, single-handedly. She only shows sporadically, apparently, she drifts in and out of town. August, the manager, has managed to get her to let him know a week in advance every time she'll be going around, though. Whenever that happens, seats sell out within a day. The people up there love her. Let me guess. Ryu made a face, counting out coins. Knowing my luck, they started promoting her next fight yesterday. Afraid so, kid, Gobi agreed. You can ask around when you get up there, but I doubt you'll have much luck. Maybe the guild can help you out, the rat's head is over on the east side, on Rat Street. Guess that explains the name, Ryu commented. I was wondering about that. I see you already know why I was asking. Guess they don't keep it a secret. It beats what the one on the other end of that street is called, let me tell you. Gobis snorted. The ale's better, too. You would be surprised how long it's taking some brewers in Corsair to catch on to the fact that open vats are a bad idea when you're too cheap to set traps. If you're looking for an inn, the rat's arms a couple doors down runs clean and cheap. I don't really want to know what a ranger's doing in Corsair asking about that girl, do I? Probably not, no. Ryu shook his head, handing over the cash. It's a long story, anyways. Anything else I should know? Like you said, it's none of my business, but be careful if you're snooping around the Colosseum. Taking Ryu's money, Goba handed over the helmet. There's been some nasty rumors going around about August recently. Some people are saying he's got connections to the Joker gang that operates around here. Even if that's bullshit, the Colosseum matches have been getting more and more violent recently. It's a bad trend, and it's leading to bad habits in the viewers, too. He snapped his fingers. One more thing. Don't know if this'll mean anything to you, but the Church of St. Eva sent a paladin into town. You don't see many of those, Ryu said, blinking. Especially not in this part of the world. Any idea what he's doing there? Nope, and I don't want to know, either. Goba shook his head. I'm real good about not knowing things I shouldn't, kid. It's how I've lived this long. Take my advice, and do the same, and you will too. Unless there's a profit in it. Ryu guessed, smiling. Depends on how much. Goba shot back, grinning as well. You're all right, kid. Good luck up there. Maybe I'll sell you something again someday. Diving off the coast, he vanished beneath the waves, and Ryu went back to his fishing. After eventually catching and eating a fat tuna, Ryu continued north, and drifted into the city of Corsair around noon. It had been a long time since he and Bao had been here, and at first glance, the city hadn't changed, the streets were familiar, and he found himself walking the same paths he had back then almost automatically, recognizing more and more the further he got. Corsair was shabbier than hometown, the streets narrow and winding with more alleys and nooks. They'd had a few close scrapes, some of them unpleasant, but all the same, it wasn't bad to be back. Not everything was the same, though. Despite the fights that were the city's most popular attraction, when they'd been there, Corsair had been a fairly relaxed city, without much turmoil. That much had clearly changed, in his first 15 minutes, he saw three fights in the streets and a violent arrest by the town guard. The guardsmen brutally pummeled the criminal, but ignored the brawling between citizens. The bars weren't open yet, so that clearly wasn't it, all that Ryu could think of was that violence was in the air, and he didn't like where that was going. 
The first thing any newcomers noticed about the city was the massive Colosseum, looming over even the outer walls, it was Corsair's heart, and the citizens wanted everybody to know it. The first time he had seen it, Ryu had stared for an hour without even moving. Bao and him had tried to get in a hundred times, and failed every single one. He knew it wasn't going to be any easier now, but just to check, he made his way towards it first. Reaching it presented him with a riot going on outside the front gate, armed and armored guards mercilessly pummeling angry citizens. There are no more tickets for sale. A weedy man in a hideous bright green doublet was shouting from behind a barred gate. I repeat, the seats are sold out for next week's fight. Anybody within a hundred feet of this entrance will be treated as a violent rioter. Leave immediately, or the Corsair Coliseum will bear no responsibility for any injuries inflicted upon your person. You have been warned. Friendly place. Ryu whistled. Yeah, I'm not getting in there that way. Shaking his head, he turned away and started looking for Rat Street. A bricklayer working on one of the houses gave him directions, and he soon found the tavern, which was still closed. The door behind it, however, was leaning open, and Ryu peeked inside. I hate to ask you to become involved in the church's business, but as the situation rests... Well, you seem to understand, a man who looked to be about Ryu's age was saying. That was the only thing they had in common, though, his hair was a long, flowing strawberry blonde mass that fell down the back of his blue enameled plate mail. He wore the entire suit, save for the helmet, with no signs of discomfort as he sat before the desk in the room, and a sword was belted at his waist. Sensing Ryu, he turned his head to look at him with piercing violet eyes. Sorry, Your Grace. Ryu held up his hands, recognizing what he was immediately. I didn't know you were talking in here. I'll come back later. That won't be necessary, young man, the man behind the desk, probably Elder Mac, told him. He looked almost as old as Elder Allen, but tough and muscular, with sun-brown skin and a completely hairless head. Despite his age, he was clearly somebody not to be trifled with. We were just concluding our discussion anyways. Indeed, the paladin agreed, standing. I'll leave it in your hands, then, Elder. Go right ahead, then, young man. Are you a resident of this town? Actually, I just arrived today, Ryu explained. I'm a ranger from hometown, to the east. Elder Allen sent me here. That seemed the best way to explain the situation without giving too many details. Ryu Battison. Ray Braddock. The paladin held out his hand, and Ryu shook it, wincing at his steel-clad grip. I'd best let you two discuss your business, then. I'll be in town for some time more, perhaps I'll see you at church later this week. I'll do my best to attend, Ryu promised, actually meaning it, in the presence of the Holy Knight, it suddenly seemed like it had been too long since one of his admittedly occasional visits to a church. Until that day, then. Ray released his hand and left. Alan sent me a message telling me about the situation, Elder Max said bluntly. Sit down, kid. He told you we can't get involved openly, right? Yeah, I understand that, Ryu agreed, taking a seat. Off the record is fine with me. What I need is information on the Coliseum, and any ideas on how I can get in there for the fight next week. I'm aware that's not going to be easy. Oh, only about as bad as mud wrestling a Biruburu, unarmed and naked, Mac grumbled. Everybody wants to know about that place recently. I've got a man on the inside, so that's helping me with my other problems, but I can't have him help you out. He thought about it for a moment. You have anything to do for the next few hours? Nothing I can't put off. Ryu shrugged. Why? We open up at three, and it's the busy season, Mac explained, jerking a thumb behind him towards the rest of the building. Why don't you help us out for a few hours? Only makes sense that another ranger would sign on as a temp for a day if we needed it. There's a couple of folks from up at the Coliseum who come in nearly every night around six. Once they show, you can bring them around. That'll start you off on the right foot, and then you can give them their next on the house for helping you out with your inquiries. I know those two, and if they can't do it, no one can. Do I get paid? Ryu asked shrewdly. Tch. Mac grinned. That what you ask everybody who does you a favor, kid. I heard it was Elder Allen who did you the favor, a while back, Ryu countered. Which would make this paying that off, and you getting five hours of work out of me on top of it. You're sharp, kid, Mac told him. I like that. All right, eight any an hour. Deal. Ryu stood up. I'll get to work, then. 
He had never worked in a tavern before, but he had visited enough of them to have a vague idea of what to do already, and he picked the rest up from Mac's two nephews who did most of the work fairly quickly. Once the doors opened at three, a couple drunks started filtering in, but it didn't really pick up until five. Even then, the four of them managed to keep up with everything, and Ryu was able to keep from botching any orders. He even picked up a few tips, mostly from female patrons, although there was one Menero in drag who he did his best to ignore. All right, kid, that's them. Mac grunted a little after six, glancing over at a pair of customers who were wandering in. Bring them what they want, then go ahead and get some for yourself too. You've earned it. Thanks, old man. Ryu nodded, wandering over to the table the two sat down at. A more oddly matched pair would have been difficult to find, both were of clans he had never seen in person before, for one. Hey there. What can I get for you? New here. The girl asked. She was about his age, and a Warren clanswoman, from the waist down, she was covered in fur, complete with an idly twitching tail. Since it was long enough to keep her decent, the only clothing she wore aside from fingerless gloves and half boots was a low-cut purple top, although steel bracers circled various places on her arms, legs, waist and neck. Her ears were pointed and furry, her hair was short and red, and her face was cute in a dangerous way, with stripes on her cheeks. A casual onlooker would have taken her to be nothing more than eye candy in a tavern like this, but the scars on her knuckles and the glint in her eyes told an entirely different story. Ale for both of us, her companion said cheerfully. Unlike her, his basic shape was the only thing humanoid about him. He was the hugest man Ryu had ever seen by a long shot, easily ten feet tall with massive shoulders and more muscles than most sports teams. His leathery gray hide accentuated his toughness even more, as did the plated brown shell that covered his back and shoulders. Another ridge crowned his head, which looked oddly tiny compared to the rest of his body, with a long snout and small eyes. Like the girl, he wore half boots with the toes out, and his were cloven. His purple toga wasn't quite as revealing her clothing, but it still left his arms and most of his upper torso bare. Two mugs of ale, coming right up. Ryu nabbed the coins out of the air as the girl threw them, earning a smile from her. Filling the mugs, he got a third for himself, took off his apron, and carried them back to the table. Mind if I sit down? Mac won't yell at you. The girl asked with a sly grin. Her teeth were very white and very sharp, he noticed, and her eyes were white and green, with mischief in them. I'm a temp, and I'm off the clock anyways, Ryu explained. He told me you two were the ones to ask about the Coliseum. That's us, all right, the big man agreed. We both work up there, and any friend of Max Good in our book. Name's Rand Marks. Ryu Battison. He took a seat and his mug. Thanks. Catch on, the girl finished the introductions and started on her ale. You don't look like the kind of guy who would try getting tickets out of us, so I'm guessing we can rule that out. Sort of. Ryu shrugged. It's ranger business, actually. I'd like to get into the Coliseum, but not for the usual reasons. He debated for a moment about how much to tell them. There was a major theft in hometown recently, and my sources are telling me that this fighting girl who's making the news up there might be the culprit. I'm trying to figure out a way to either confirm or deny, but that's not looking likely without being able to get in there. Kat and Rand lowered their mugs and stared at each other. What? Ryu asked. Oh, nothing, Rand replied, smiling, as Kat lowered her head and began to laugh. That's just a hell of a story, that's all. Which leads me to believe it's probably true. You can't make this stuff up. How much do you know about the girl on stage, anyways? Not much, Ryu admitted. But then, even if I knew her name, it wouldn't help me. How about you two? We work construction and repairs, so we're not in the arena when the show's on, Rand explained. You would think we'd get to go watch for free since we work there, but Mr. Conti is kind of a tightwad. His wallet's tighter than his ass, Kat agreed, recovering from her fit of laughter. Taking a long drink, she lowered the mug and smirked at Ryu. Speaking of ass, you sure you don't just want to get in so you can watch a pretty girl kick some? Tempting, but business before pleasure, Ryu drawled. I've got a lot writing on this, so it's kind of important. Well, let's put our heads together then. Rand drained his mug. After we get some refills, anyways. Sounds good to me. Ryu signaled one of Mac's nephews, who knew what was going on and took their mugs without collecting money. On the house. My treat. Okay, now we have to help him out, Kat told Rand in a dramatically serious tone. Without a doubt, Rand agreed. 
Okay, let's put our heads together. Tickets are obviously out, and we'll never be able to sneak him and his staff. Why not? Cat frowned. Remember when that last guy tried that? Rand reminded her. He would have made it, too, if he wasn't drunk at the time. Ever since then, the supervisors have all been cracking down hard on that. I don't know what Mr. Conti's more worried about, some idiot interfering with the fights, or breaking into his office. Let's go with both, then. Cat drank some more ale. It'll save time. Wiping her mouth, she glanced at Ryu. If tickets are out, and so is staff, that just leaves one more way. You look like you're tough. Are you? You don't last long in this line of work if you're not, Ryu replied easily. No formal training or anything, but I can hold my own. I get what you're thinking. Rand slowly nodded. Entering as a contestant? That'll get him into the Coliseum, all right, but not on the big night. Mr. Conti makes fighters buy their own tickets just like anybody else these days. Unless you were thinking. Exactly, Cat agreed, grinning impishly. All right, what am I missing? Ryu looked from one of them to the other. We work up there, so we already know who the girl's next opponent is, Rand explained. Guy named Baba, from up north in the Tagwoods. A lumberjack. Real mountain man guy. He's known for fighting with this huge axe. It's five more days until the big fight, Cat continued. He won't be coming down here until the day before. Say you head up there first, brawl with him, and take that axe of his when you win. Then you come down here, say you're Baba, and show him that axe as proof. Bing bang bong, you're in. Sounds like I came to the right people. Ryu smiled. Nobody's going to notice that I'm not exactly the mountain man type. The way people will see it is, if you took Baba down, you'll be even better in a fight than he was. Rand chuckled. So the fight will be even better, too. That's all they care about, when you get right down to it. They might lose all of Baba's paperwork and make you go through that again, though. I think I can live with that, considering, Ryu said dryly. Well, as much as I'd like to stay up drinking all night, I should probably turn in if I'm heading up to the Tagwoods tomorrow. Will you two be there on Sunday? Maybe. Cat smirked. We'll see what we can do, hey? Stop by here and see us again once you get back, and it might encourage us. You know, I think I'll do that. Finishing his mug, Ryu stood up. See you in a few days, then. We'll be here. Rand waved laconically as he walked out. The inn Goba had suggested was where he had said it was, and the rates were cheap. After getting a good night's sleep under his belt, Ryu did as they had suggested, leaving the town once more and heading north. The tagwoods they had told him about were one of the many clumps of forest spread around Tentar, reportedly, the forest clan lived there, but he doubted he had actually see any of them during his trip. From what he had heard, even native humans could and usually would go for years, even decades, without even catching a glimpse of the elusive canids, it was unlikely that any of them would be inclined to greet a traveling stranger. Two days traveling north brought him to the edge of the woods, and after camping out there for the night, he entered the next morning. Almost immediately, it was as if he had been in the woods for days. Hundreds of trees quickly surrounded him, growing tall and thick enough that their spreading branches blocked out most of the sun. Fallen leaves and branches covered the ground, and moss grew profusely. Guy could get lost here real easy, he muttered, then frowned as he heard the sound of wings flapping. Hi. A harpy, identical to the ones he and Bao had slain at Mount Fuby, said cheerfully as she flew through the trees. A traveler, hey? You look delicious. Thanks, lady, Ryu quipped, unconcerned. Shame I can't return the compliment. There was probably no point in asking her where to find Baba, so he drew his sword and waited for her to swoop down. Feasty, aren't you? She giggled. We'll see how fiery you are in a few minutes. Over here, big guy. Big guy. Ryu repeated as crashing and growling noises began drawing closer. Oh, this isn't going to be good. It wasn't. A moment later, a furry monstrosity smashed its way through the foliage. Despite being bipedal, there was no semblance of humanity about the shaggy green and white creature, its massive arms ended in paws with wicked, six-inch claws, and its head was a feral snarl that seemed to protrude directly from its shoulder without a neck. It was slightly ursine, but only barely, that, though, was enough for Ryu to identify it as a bugbear. You make the kill, I'll eat the spill. The harpy crowed, and the bugbear obliged, charging at Ryu with a fearsome roar. 
I hate this place already. He snarled, falling back as the beast swung. Its attack was massive, but slow, and the clawed limb whooshed over him as he put his hands back to steady his landing. Springing back to his feet, he slashed at the side of its head, carving a bloody trail. Unfortunately, this seemed insufficient, it struck again, this time ripping into his chest and slamming him into a tree. Ugh! Ryu hissed, clutching his wound with one hand. Despite the pain, though, he still stood firmly as the beast advanced. Growling still, it paused, apparently not expecting him to still be fighting. That proved fatal, ducking under its next swipe, Ryu struck at the same spot he had hit earlier with a two-handed blow, taking the monster's head. Ah! The harpy screamed. Shrieking curses, she dived recklessly, and Ryu met her with his blade, cleaving her in two in mid-flight. Ow, 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 he hissed, removing his shirt. All right, time to see just how bad I am at white magic again. Concentrating, he attempted to cast a healing spell. As when Bao cast it, light fell over him, but the healing was less effective, the wounds closed, but that was all. That'll have to do. Guess I should be glad it worked that well. Putting his shirt back on, he glanced at the bodies once, then shook his head and started walking again. Though there was a path through the woods, it was hardly easy to follow, doubling back and splitting off on numerous occasions. Sighing, Ryu resigned himself to a long day searching for the lumberjack. More harpies and bugbears infested the woods, along with the carnivorous man-eater plants that also plagued the rest of Tentar. There were other monsters as well, but unfamiliarity with the area had its drawbacks, even when he and Bao had come through Tentar in their childhood, they hadn't been crazy enough to go into the woods at their age. When he came across a stump with branches like arms, he shrugged it off and turned away, only realizing his mistake just in time to dodge its swipe. Turning, he saw that what he had taken for an odd horizontal knot had opened up, revealing a huge blue eye that rolled madly as it stared at him. Before he could counterattack, though, an axe almost as large as he was descended, splitting the monster from branch to root. Never seen a Dokadan before, kid? The man holding the axe asked, pulling it from the slain arboreal menace. Despite being human, he was almost as big as Rand, though stouter and shorter. His earth brown hair and beard were wild and long, both almost reaching his waist, and he wore a sleeveless green tunic, with bands around his wrists and forehead. Gotta watch out! The dem things will use fire magic if you piss em off without killing em fast, and that's a no-no around here, to put it lightly. Wish I knew what dem god had that bright idea when he put those things together. I'd like to shake the dumb bass's hand, real hard. No kidding. Ryu winced, imagining it. Thanks for the save. Baba the lumberjack, I presume. That's me, Baba Dari, the big man agreed. What's a kid like you doing in a place like this, hey? I'll skip to the point, Ryu said, smiling slightly. Hate to do this after you just helped me out, but I'm going to need that axe of yours. Them's fight in words, kid. Baba smiled back, but his eyes were dangerous. Down in Corsair, trying that would get a nice little brawl going anywhere, anywhen. I'm guessing that's what you're here about. The Coliseum, right? On Sunday. Came here hunting me down over it. Now, ain't that cute? Pretty much. Ryu kept his hand on his sword, watching the lumberjack carefully. It's a long story, but I'm going to need to get in there. Not happening, kid. Baba turned his head one way, then the other, cracking his neck. That little girl's getting an awful big head down there. It's about time somebody gave her a lesson in reality, before it gets handed to her the hard way. I'm kind of a nice guy like that, and you don't look like you would be up to it. That's why I'm coming for you first, isn't it? Ryu asked challengingly. If I can take you down, means I stand a better chance than you do. Cocky, ain't cha? Baba's eyes narrowed, but the dragon tear went a shade greener, showing approval. All right, kid, I'm interested. Let's see if you can back it up. Gripping his axe in both hands, he took up a ready stance, then swung a mighty overhand blow. Despite the fact that Ryu dodged the attack, the force of it still shoved him further away, kicking up leaves and branches as it carved a furrow in the earth. Yeesh, Ryu muttered, moving around Baba as he pulled his axe back. The big man clearly had him beat on both range and power, but Ryu's speed was superior. That wasn't much of an advantage compared to his opponents, but it was all he had, and he knew how to use it. Waiting for Baba's next attack, he sidestepped the blow and stepped in, sword slashing at his opponent's wrists. Before he could hit, though, the lumberjack deftly moved his weapon sideways, the pole deflecting Ryu's sword even as the flat of the axe head slammed into his side. Thought you had me, didn't you? Baba laughed as Ryu fell back, winded. Not gonna be that easy, kid. 
So I see, Ryu muttered, stepping back. As powerful as the blows were, Hava clearly knew what he was doing, and he wasn't going to let the axe get lodged in the ground. Other things, however, were a different story. Backing off from the lumberjack's attacks, he pretended to stumble over the roots of a tree when he felt them underfoot, tumbling backwards against the trunk. As Baba lunged forward, he angled his roll to the side instead, and the axe whooshed past him, slamming into the tree trunk. Hey! Baba yelled as Ryu rose, sword slashing up at his enemy's arm. Unfortunately, the big man surprised Ryu again, rather than trying to dodge the attack, he caught the sword in one meaty hand, gripping it tightly despite the obvious pain as the blade cut into his palm. His other fist swung out, and Ryu took it in the side of his head. Reeling, he nevertheless replied with a punch of his own, rattling Baba's jaw. The two of them laid into each other like tavern brawlers for a few minutes, neither of them relaxing their grip on either end of Ryu's sword, once he had gotten a hold of it, Baba had adjusted his grasp so that he held onto the backside, keeping it from slicing his hand completely through. Despite that, it was still bleeding heavily, and as it became apparent that punches alone weren't going to bring Ryu down quickly, his expression grew more and more irritated. Finally, rather than punch him, he seized Ryu's free hand with his own, shoved him against another tree, and delivered a staggering headbutt. Even with his new helmet, Ryu crumpled, vision swimming, and Baba turned away to retrieve his axe. He tried to get back up, and after a false start or two did so, but he was still seeing stars, and the lumberjack had freed his weapon with his unwounded hand. As he brought it down once more, Ryu narrowed his eyes, gritted his teeth, and reacted on pure instinct rather than thought. A part of him he usually tried to suppress, that arose from and helped him survive the worst parts of a childhood spent in stinking alleys and roadside ditches, kicked in and drove him forward, past the axe blade and inside Baba's range. Instead of attacking Baba, he sliced at the wooden pole of his axe. Hey! Baba asked, blankly staring, as the axe head spun off into the trees. As his eyes went to the pole, Ryu stabbed his other hand, and he dropped the pole with a howl of pain. Falling back, he met Ryu's eyes, both of them breathing heavily. Well, Ryu asked after a long moment. Still want to keep going? Like this? Baba snorted. Don't be ridiculous. Saint Eva damn it all. He shook his head, sitting down. I can tell when I've lost, kid. Here. He tossed the axe's pole at Ryu's feet. You'll have to repair it yourself, though. I can do that. Ryu leaned back against a tree, smiling. Good fight. You would have had me with the headbutt if it wasn't for this. He tapped a finger on his new helmet. Just picked it up the other day. Looks like I made the right call there. Yeah. Baba chuckled, wincing. Gotta admit, it was. Shame we couldn't do it in the Coliseum. His face turned serious. Honestly, though, I've been thinking about getting out of that game for a while anyways. Now I've got a reason to. The place just ain't what it used to be anymore. I take it you aren't referring to girls getting in? Ryu asked dryly. As if. Baba rolled his eyes. As long as they don't mind getting their hands bloody, more power to em. But the people running the place. August most of all. They've been taking it in a different direction lately, and I don't like it. There's fighting for sport, and then there's kill shows. It might not seem like much of a difference, but trust me, there is, especially when it comes to audience participation. You get what I'm saying here. Oh, yeah. Ryu slowly nodded. I'll make sure to watch my back down there, then. Thanks for the heads up. He hesitated before asking his next question. Want a healing spell? I'm crap at it, but it looks like we could both use one. Let me, kid. Baba began chanting, and in a couple showers of light, both men's wounds healed. That's better. Standing back up, he raised one eyebrow. I don't really want to know why you need to get into that fight, do I? It's a long story. Ryu shrugged, walking over to claim the axe head. Let's just say I might have some old business with this cocky fighting girl. Oh. After a moment, Baba began to laugh. Oh, I get it now. Ha. Huh. Now it all makes sense. Wait, what? Ryu blinked, then realized what he had said, and started laughing as well despite himself. No, no, not like that. Sure, kid, sure. Baba clapped him on the shoulder, still laughing. You had better get moving, then, if you want to make it back to Corsair in time. I was just getting ready to head out myself when you found me. Yeah. Ryu made a face. I just hope I can remember the way back through all these trees and shit. 
Why don't I help you with that a little? Baba offered. Let me ask you something. You any good at climbing trees, kid? I can make it up and down one fine, Ryu said with a shrug. Why do you ask? Just make sure you grab hold onto one on your way down. Baba replied with an evil chuckle. Before Ryu could respond, he had grabbed hold of him by the scruff of his neck, actually picking him up bodily. With a mighty heave, he hurled Ryu into the air, through the treetops. Ah, she ain't it. Screaming, he sailed over the tagwoods towards the edge, then came down again, right towards the trees. Despite his terror, he still maintained enough presence of mind to do as Baba had suggested, trying to grab a branch. After a few failed attempts and subsequent painful bounces, one of which roused a thoroughly surprised harpy, he succeeded, and was able to climb down with minimal fuss afterward. It had definitely saved him time, but on the whole, he had had more pleasant experiences while traveling, including the time he had fallen over a waterfall. The trip back to Corsair was much the same as the one from it to the Tagwoods, albeit slightly more unpleasant due to the necessity of lugging a gigantic broken axe around the entire way. As soon as he was back in town, the first thing he did was make a trip to the general store for a roll of tape so he could fix the axe. The Menero shopkeeper didn't bat an eyelid upon seeing him with it, simply ringing him up as if nothing was out of the ordinary at all. He repaired it as best as he could on a bench outside, the end result was hardly satisfactory, but it would do. Hoisting it over his shoulder, Ryu headed to the Coliseum. Tickets are all sold out, the guard behind the gate said laconically as Ryu approached, not looking up. Got a problem, take it up with. He broke off as Ryu set the axe down on the ground, glancing at it, then him. Name's Baba, Ryu told him flatly. I'm in the fight tomorrow. Sure, kid. The guard looked him over, then snorted. And I'm the princess of High Fort. Go on, beat it. Listen, you. Ryu started to say, then paused, catching sight of somebody more familiar. Up on the exterior of the Colosseum's second level, Rand was working, spreading plaster over a damaged spot. Hey, Rand. Mind helping me out down here? It's me, Baba. Hey. Rand glanced down, then jumped. As Ryu watched, surprised, he curled himself into a ball, the curved armored plates on his back covering him completely. Upon hitting the ground, he rolled around in a circle, slowing down until he uncurled and stood back up. Looking Ryu over, he smiled. Hey, Baba. Made it down here? What's the hold up? This guy won't let me in. Ryu thumbed at the guard, who was looking back and forth between them, confused. Uh, Rand? What's going on here? This guy's in tomorrow's fight, Rand told him, still smiling. Babadari, right? He's got that axe, right? Everybody knows about that, right? Oh. The guard smiled as well after a moment, as the light finally dawned. Oh, all right. Sorry, Mr. Dury. Didn't, uh, recognize you. Snorting, he pulled a lever, and the gate retracted. Right this way. Thanks, man, Ryu told Rand, following the guard in. No problem, Rand replied cheerfully as he turned away, presumably to return to his work. See you tonight. The guard led Ryu into the Colosseum's lobby, a massive, expensively decorated hall with tile flooring, tapestries hanging on the walls and interior fountains. More guards stood around at various places, chatting to each other lazily, though they didn't seem to be paying much attention, the sheer numbers said more than they probably realized. One was even behind the front desk, feet propped up on it. Nodding to him, Ryu's escort took him to the right, past several more guards standing around a wooden door. Hey, Jean, he said as he walked through, hailing a girl behind another desk in the main center of the room. A multitude of other doors covered every wall, each with a brass nameplate on it. Baba from Tagwoods is here. I see. The girl gave Ryu a clinical once-over, her eyes lingering on the axe strapped to his back. I'll take it from here, Eddie. Go on back to your post. Gotcha. The guard gave Ryu an incomprehensible hand gesture that would probably lose all meaning within a couple years and left. We've been waiting for you to check in, Mr. Dury. Jean turned on what looked like a standard smile. While we're glad to see you here, I'm afraid there's been an error in our filing system. We've lost all your paperwork. So I have to fill it in again. Ryu replied. No sweat. I can write. Kind of. No, no, our director of human resources will do that, Jean told him, shaking her head. He'll want to interview you again, is all. He's in right now, why don't you go on in? Third door on the right. 
All right. Nodding, Ryu walked over and knocked on the door marked, Andre, before opening it and walking in. For a moment, he thought he had made a wrong turn, the room inside was solid stone all around, like a dungeon. The effect was amplified by the room's inhabitant, a muscle-bound hulk who looked like he modeled for statues in his spare time. Bald as an egg with a perfect tan, he wore only a bright red, very small swimsuit and a bow tie, how the latter stayed on was a question Ryu didn't particularly care to ask. More importantly, he was chained to the wall, manacles attached to all of his wrists and ankles. Despite this, he also sat at a wooden desk, and was writing something down by candlelight. Yes. He looked up, tiny eyes squinting at Ryu through a tiny pair of spectacles. Can I help you? Jean sent me in for an interview, Ryu explained, resisting the urge to flee for his life. I see. Removing his glasses, he stood up, chains clinking. Well, let's get started then. In a swift movement, he flexed his arms, and a burst of force from his muscles actually entered the air between them, slamming Ryu back against the door. State your name for the record, please. Babadari, Ryu grunted, prying himself off the door. Before he could move in to attack, though, the director flexed again in a different pose, and the resulting force slammed him into the floor face first. Education? He asked casually. None, Ryu replied, peeling himself off the floor. Occupation? The director struck a pose, ramming Ryu against the back wall again. I'm a lumberjack and I'm okay, Ryu muttered dryly, spread eagled. I sleep all night and work all day. Hobbies? The director crouched, hands on knees, and stumped the floor with one foot, then the other. The first knocked Ryu off the wall, and the second onto his ass. Smoking? Ryu stood up again and made a run for him. Drinking? Fishing? Fighting? Talents? The director started shadow boxing, each blow knocking Ryu in a different direction. Axe throwing, log rolling, and whittling, Ryu answered in between pained wheezing. All right, you pass. The director sat back down suddenly, pulling his glasses back on and returning to his paperwork. Go on out and tell Jean. Ryu thought about making some sort of objection to the entire debacle, but in the end, he just cut his losses and left. Still conscious? The secretary noted. A pass, then. I was fairly sure it would be, but we do have protocol to follow. The manager, Mr. Conti, has been notified of your arrival, and he asked to meet with you once you were done. Down at the far end. She identified the door. All right. Wincing, Ryu walked down and knocked before opening the door. Mr. Conti? I'm Baba Dari. Ah, Baba. Come in, come in. The man inside the room told him, without getting up from where he was seated, in front of a roaring fireplace. Please, sit down. Call me August. The room was even more expensively decorated than the rest of the Colosseum, with luxurious padded chairs and couches before the fire. Weapons of every kind hung on the walls, and each corner had a different suit of armor standing in it. Passing a gold-trimmed desk, Ryu took a seat in a chair opposite the manager, then turned his eyes to the man who ruled the Colosseum. August Conti was a slender man in his mid-fifties, by the looks of him, short and thin with long, delicate-looking fingers steepled in front of his face as he watched the fire roaring. Despite his age, his dark red hair held no touches of gray, worn long down his back in an obvious show of vanity. His features were harsh and unattractive, eyes deeply sunken. One turned to Ryu, as red as his hair, while the other remained on the fire, but he remained silent, apparently waiting for Ryu to speak first. Glad I made it here on time, Ryu said eventually. Almost got held up in the tagwoods. Still, no harm no foul. Indeed, August murmured, his other eye turning to Ryu as well. Your first time here, isn't it, Baba? Well, luckily, your opponent tomorrow will be a woman. An easy win, wouldn't you say? I don't know, Ryu replied noncommittally, remembering the thief girl. He had only had a quick glimpse of her, but from what he had seen, she hadn't looked like a pushover. I've met some pretty tough girls before. Oh. One of August's eyes widened dramatically. A believer in equal rights, I see. How? Refreshing. Many male warriors believe that women pose no threat to them. They're usually wrong. Especially against our spirited little firebrand. He laughed briefly, then subsided. But fear not, Baba. For you see, the winner of tomorrow's fight has already been decided. I've written the script, and all the lines have been planned to perfection, to stir the hearts of the onlookers. 
Okay, you've got my attention, Ryu replied after a moment, keeping his voice calm to conceal the alarms shrieking in his head. I'm listening. Casually, he checked the dragon's tear and confirmed his suspicion, August was reading the same deep red as his hair, a very bad sign. It will be a marvelous, emotional show, August continued, eyes on the fire again, seeming more like he was talking to himself than Ryu. After a long, brutal fight, Baba gains an edge over the girl. She falls, pitiful and broken, and some men would show her mercy. But no, not today. Baba is a cruel man, and he knows not what the word means. The winner of the match decides the fate of the loser, and so, before the cheering crowd, he brings her sad young life to a slow, tortuous end. As he spoke, the dragon's tear darkened further, to an oily, noxious black. Hey. Ryu pretended to think it over, while focusing on keeping himself under control. Despite the revulsion he felt, an outburst would almost certainly be fatal. And the crowd will go for it. Oh, yes, August assured him with a haunting grin, turning his full gaze on him now. The population's taste for violence has been growing lately. Seeing such a fan favorite fall before their eyes, disappointing them so. Well, they may even be cheering you on, urging you to make her pay for letting them down. What do you say, Baba? Hell, that works for me. It took every ounce of deception Ryu had in him to smile at the man. Like I care what happens to her? As long as I get the glory, I don't care. That and the pay. The pay's good, right? Very much so. August turned one eye back to the fire, while the other remained on Ryu. You see, the reason we can assure you of your triumph is simple. A friend of mine recently supplied me with some rather exquisite poison from the wasteland of Skanda. Exactly five minutes in, I'll have one of my men use a blowgun to hit her with a needle coated in that same poison. She'll fall into a stupor almost immediately, and after a few days under, die peacefully. But why wait for that? Once she falls, you can kill her however you... Or the crowd. Wish. Sounds pretty dangerous. Ryu grunted. What happens if I'm the one who gets nailed instead, hey? I advise you take every precaution to ensure that that is not the case, August said dryly. You asked about the money. I believe, once you examine the sum in your locker room tomorrow, you'll agree that it compensates for the slight risk involved. Yeah, okay, Ryu grumbled. Long as it's worth it. Just hope your shooter knows what the hell he's doing. He will, I assure you. August turned his remaining eye to the fire as well. Well then, I won't keep you. Return here at 5 o'clock tomorrow, and your locker room will be ready for you. The fight starts at 6. Gotcha. Ryu stood up, mind still racing furiously. See you then. He turned away, self-control forcing his legs to move, to carry him out the door and away. Jean gave him a nod and a quick smile as he left, he returned the nod, but not the smile. As he left the right wing, another man passed by him going the other way, Ray, the paladin. Their eyes met in surprise for a moment, and then they both kept walking, neither of them saying a word. What's he doing in there? Ryu muttered to himself once he was out of earshot. Just what I needed. Something else to wonder about. He nodded perfunctorily to the guards as he left the Coliseum, making his way down the street to a nearby park where he could rest under a tree and do some thinking. August's offer was, of course, completely out of the question. Morality notwithstanding, if his opponent tomorrow was the thief, then her untimely death would kill any hopes of vindicating Bao as well. However, directly refusing August's offer or making any attempt at confronting him would just get him killed. The manager's influence in the city would make going to the authorities an impossibility as well. There was a solution somewhere, he knew, but no matter how hard as he tried to think, it wasn't coming to him. In the end, he got up and went to the rat's head with no plan and no idea what he was going to do. The tavern was busy, so he didn't bother Elder Mac aside from getting some ale. Instead, he took a table and kept an eye out for Rand and Cat. After almost an hour, he was signaling for another refill when a light hand grabbed his head with far more strength than one would expect and rubbed his hair roughly. Gotcha! Cat snickered, letting him go and taking a seat next to him. Should have looked around better. All right, I'll bite. Ryu did his best to fix his hair. How would you get in here? Back door, Rand explained, walking up and sitting down as well. We saw you in here before we came in, and she wanted to pull a prank. Why am I not surprised by this? Ryu rolled his eyes as one of Mac's nephews walked over. Ale all around, I take it. Of course. Cat put one elbow on the table and leaned forward, smirking. So. 
What's with the axe? Oh, I didn't tell you last time. Ryu played along. I'm actually Babadari. Sorry, I should have brought it up. So you're gonna be in the fight tomorrow? Ren sighed dramatically. Rats. Your name's pretty weird. I was hoping I'd get to see one between a cute girl and some freaky whack job. That would have been better. Very funny, Ryu replied dryly. Sorry to disappoint you, Chief. I don't know. Cat raised an eyebrow. He's not too bad looking himself. This way, everybody gets someone to look at. For those who like it violent, that is, Ryu pointed out, raising an eyebrow. Not everybody does, you know. Would they be going in the first place if they didn't? She countered. Good point, he conceded. I'll be sure to put on a good show, then. I'll be looking forward to it. She leaned back and exchanged a smirk with Rand. So, the big man said before Ryu could ask what was going on. You never told us exactly why it's so important to you that you catch this girl you're looking for. I get that she knocked over some places in your hometown, but you're acting like it's personal. Did she take something of yours, or what? Not exactly. Ryu thought about it a moment, then decided to trust them, after all, he already was, in a way. Keep this to yourselves, but my partner's been framed for the big job she pulled. I have to bring her back if I want to clear his name. Ouch. Cat winced sympathetically. Yeah, that's pretty bad. I'd offer to help you out, but we haven't actually been here that long, so it's not like we have much of an information network or anything. We have got to start going places other than here in the Coliseum, Rand agreed. You two came in together. Ryu guessed. Been friends for a while. Not all that long. Rand chuckled. We met up west of here, over in a lodge north of Gate. Since we were both heading the same way, we figured we might as well go together, and neither of us really found anything in Windia that was worth sticking around for. Is that place still around? Ryu asked, thinking back. Must be nine years now since the last time I was there. Good to know. You've been up there too, hey? Cat replied teasingly. Not a hometown boy all your life, then. As if. Ryu rolled his eyes. Me and my buddy just settled in there when they actually let us apprentice as rangers. Up until then, it was life on the open road for us. Nowhere to go, no place to be. Story of my life. Cat shrugged. Guess I'll be sticking around here for a while, but this is the first time something like it's come up. Girl out on the open road alone. Ryu raised an eyebrow. There must have been some assholes who got the wrong idea about that. A few times. She examined her scarred knuckles. Funny thing, though. None of them ever tried it more than once. She's a Warren clanswoman, Rand explained with a small grin. They almost all grow up alone. It's a cultural thing for them. So you can probably imagine how tough their kids need to be to survive that. Breath of spirit. Cat grinned, flexing a bicep. Nothing showy like other clans, but ramped up strength, speed, and agility. I was lifting guys off the ground by their necks back when I was waist high. So, only a couple years ago. Rand joked, receiving a punch in the arm for it. Ow. That must have been interesting to see, Ryu commented. Pretty cool. I've always kind of wondered what it's like to have breath. He chuckled. Used to hope something from an ancestor I didn't know about would crop up out of nowhere one day, actually. I mean, blue hair? Not exactly normal. It's not dyed. Cat sniffed the air. Hey, it really isn't. That is kind of weird. She paused, looking awkward. Did you, um... Know your parents? A little, Ryu said with forced calm. They died. But I remember I got it from my mother. The old stories say light dragons all had blue hair and green eyes, Rand suggested. Maybe you secretly have dragon clan blood. Yeah, sure, and maybe I'm a long-lost prince of Windia, too, Ryu snarked, and they all laughed, finishing off their mugs. Refills. Cat suggested. I don't know. Rand poked Ryu. Our pal Baba here's got a big day ahead of him tomorrow, after all. Thanks for bringing it up, Dad. Ryu snorted. What about you, then? Farm clan, right. You got it. Rand nodded. Let me guess. You've never seen one of us before. 
Outside of books, Ryu admitted. I'm guessing there's a reason for that. Most of us stay home, he explained. We're pretty sedentary, which makes me something of a freak, I guess. And even I didn't leave until I was almost 30. Wayward vagabonds all around, all the same. Ryu raised his empty mug. To the open road, and not having to sleep on it tonight at least. Amen to that. Cat raised her mug, and Rand did so as well. Guess we probably shouldn't have too much either, he suggested. No point in being hung over tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Grumbling, she gazed at the mug. One more round. Rand's right in my case, Ryu reluctantly pointed out, remembering his promise to Ray. I should get going. Fine, fine. Cat put it down. We might as well too, then. Think about how nice it'll be to wake up without a headache for once, Rand told her as they all left the table. We don't drink that much, she protested. Most nights, anyways. Well, some nights. You know what I mean. Hey, if there's something wrong with good brown ale, there's something wrong with you, Ryu pointed out, leading the way out onto the street. See this? Cat clapped him on the shoulder. This guy knows what's going on. Two of them. Rand clutched his forehead. I don't think I'll be able to handle two of them. Hate to disappoint you, but I'm probably not sticking around, Ryu reminded them. If tomorrow pans out, I'll be taking her back to hometown. If it doesn't, I'll probably look around here a bit more for the thief before heading off. More leads to check up on. Cat guessed. There's one back in hometown, too, but that one's going to be a pain in the ass to look into, which is why I came here first, he explained. If I do a detailed search of here and there and come up with squat, I'll have to assume she went west of here. The only other way she could have gone by land is across the mountains to the south, and if that's the case I'm pretty much screwed. She might have left by sea, Rand suggested. You would be in even more trouble then, wouldn't you? Don't even say that, man. Ryu groaned. Here's hoping that works out, then, Kat said with a grin. Maybe we'll be able to help you out with that some. Let's talk about that after tomorrow night either works or doesn't. Sounds like a plan. Ryu glanced at the rat's arms as he reached it, but didn't go in. Instead, he leaned against the building, looking up at the night sky. It's been eight years since I've been to this city, you know? It's changed, since then. There's more blood on the air. He chuckled self-consciously. That probably sounds weird, but it just feels that way to me. No, you're right. Kat agreed, leaning against the wall as well, next to him. Crossing her arms, she looked up too. Something about never being in the same place for too long does it to you. You start to get a feel for what the mood is like when you head in somewhere. She grinned then, and it wasn't with the same cheerfulness as before, but something fiercer, wilder. Something she normally didn't show. The fact that she was now probably meant something, but Ryu wasn't sure what. This is my kind of town right now. But that's a thin line, and it's heading downhill. This keeps up. I might not like it around here for too much longer. I can't tell if that's one of the craziest things I've ever heard you say, or one of the least. Ran sighed gustily, but took up position alongside them, then glanced at Ryu, his features serious. She's got a point, though. Be careful up there tomorrow. Something's wrong in the Coliseum. Everybody's heard the rumors, of course, but I'm not talking about that. I don't know what it is. But whatever it is, it's seriously bad. Just watch your back. I try to do that on general principle, Ryu muttered, thinking about Agus's plan. For a moment, he considered asking them about it, but he threw that idea away almost immediately. They were helping him enough already, they had their own lives, and their own problems. There was no sense getting them dragged into something that wasn't their business any further than he already had. Instead, he remained silent, and the three of them lingered there for some time, as clouds crept over the skies. Damn, Cat muttered as drops of water began to fall. I hate the rain. Can't say I'm too fond of it either, Ryu admitted. Too many nights ten miles from shelter. I kind of like it, myself. Ren shrugged. You could just go on in. Nah, Ryu said, still looking up. In a few minutes. What he said, Kat agreed. Right. Rand rolled his eyes, but didn't argue the point any further. The rain continued to fall, and they remained there, watching it come. 
three wandering souls, with nothing and everything in common, waiting to see what tomorrow would bring. Tomorrow comes today.